Hi, Adonis, is that you? Hi, Dr. Friedrich, yes. Hi. Uh, do you know, because uh, the, the one of the authors didn't receive a reminder email, do you know whether the additional invitation has gone out for the search on Uh I know Danny was able to send out the email a little bit earlier. I think it went out around uh, 9.45, something like that. Uh, I can... Today, okay. Yeah. And uh, and uh, but yesterday isn't it usually one day before? So the usually it's on the Thursday before and then the day of at ten fifteen. Mm -hmm. But I think, anyways, there was a a slight miscommunication, I guess, and uh, he ended up sending it though just today. Okay. Would you like me to resend the the link to both authors? Um, sorry, a link to both authors? No, uh, no, I think both authors are aware. Okay. Uh, it was just whether the the rest of the community uh, knows it, um, because they usually also uh, are invited for that, right? Yes. Uh, except again, and you know, do you know whether that email went out? The email for the actual journal club went out only this morning. Oh, oh that's what you said. Okay, okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so we have to make sure that uh, this always, um, yeah, always happens in time. Okay. Okay. Hey, Nicole. Hey, how are you? I'm good. Did you dig out of emails yet from the SMR? Mostly. Oh. We had um, grant submission right after that, oh, and um, it was really busy. So I'm kind of like decompressing now. But next week I'm headed to India for the Accessible MRI conference. So it's just like one thing to the next. So wow. never a, a dull moment here. Wow, that's interesting. I guess I'll where, I, uh, where where is that in India? In Delhi, in New Delhi. In Delhi, okay. Yeah. Um, so is Vikas, it mostly about India or uh, more global? Everywhere, everywhere. It's really global. Yeah. Um, yeah Vikas is the um, like primary organizer, and then I'm on the organizing committee. Um, so we're bringing the kids this time to to India, which will be exciting. It's their first time in India. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Yeah. 
Yeah, I have also a little bit of activity in India with the um with the OS CMR. Ah, yeah, yeah that's we awesome. We ha have that in um we have that starting in uh, Vellore, in southern India province of um yeah. Chennai, and uh, yeah, so yeah, working with them to establish that. That's super cool. Because actually. because for them it means no contrast agents and no cardiologists on site means a lot to them. Yeah, yeah that's a, that's actually incredible. If that gets running, that would be super cool. Not just in India, but yeah. but in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we we're just currently um, fine tuning the the biomarkers, comparing the methodologies. So hopefully we can submit that paper in in a, in a few weeks. Sweet. And, uh, then um, then um, so people can then pick their favorite biomarker and. Oh, good luck. Fingers crossed for you. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. Okay, so welcome everybody. Um, we we will wait uh, for a minute or so for those who um, find it uh, difficult to, to log on. Um, the invitation reminder has gone out a little bit later this time, so I hope it doesn't affect the attendance too much. Um, yeah, I I was hoping that people put that in their calendar, but um, still uh, in, invitations are necessary. Hi, Kiaran. Good seeing you. So, oh, I thank on. you very much for yeah. the invitation. Much appreciated. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's a pleasure. Thanks for wanting to join here. Um, Hello. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, Hi. Yeah, I'm just testing the uh, sound because the uh, camera is not working. So, but fortunately, the uh, audio is good. Hopefully. Okay, but I think we had you shortly on camera now. Do you, do you see me on, on camera? Mm, not right now. Okay, so I think um, still may people uh, still people may log on, but um, I think we can uh, get started. So um, today um, I'm very happy to uh, address uh, an interesting aspect of CMR. So for a long time of my career, CMR was more about showing that we could do things. Uh, and now it's often about uh, already about how this affects clinical decision making and whether you can have, uh, let's say, second order markers such as prognosis and impact on outcomes. So that's great. And two, there are two topics today that uh, we found very interesting. One is looking at um, left ventricle filling pressure, which is for a cardiologist, which is an important marker, but there was, of course, um, initially no way uh, to uh, do the measure that non-invasively. And now that's uh, possible. And now uh, taking this technology, uh, the, um, the group uh, from Norwich together with uh, other centers uh, has addressed that and looking at, is looking at the correlation of symptoms and signs and prognosis in heart failure. And then afterwards, we will have uh, Ahmed Fahmi from uh, Reza Nesafat's team regard radiomics um, and their paper in Jack Imaging, Jack Cardiovascular Imaging, on uh, late, uh, radiomics of late gut linen enhancement um, and the prognostic value in uh, scar heterogeneity in uh, atrophic cardiomyopathy. So um, maybe we can get started, Kiaran, with you with uh, the paper on left ventricular filling pressure. So if you could just share your screen, thanks yeah. for joining and uh, share your screen. And uh, uh, I mean, how's just um, uh, the general rule is 10 minutes, uh, roughly go through the PDF, then uh, we have a short discussion and then we go to the next paper. So just walking through the PDF. Uh, any questions, please post in the chat or uh, if, it, if it fits, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, thanks, Kieran. Oh, I'm just setting up my screen sharing. Just come on, man. I think it's because I've got such a, I've got a yeah, bit yeah. ultra wide. I don't know. Yeah. If I can maybe I just. Yeah, yeah, may have to. Yeah, it was um, zoomed in, but. Hi, Vic. Hi, Vic. Thanks for joining. OK, can you okay. see? Yeah, great. Uh, it's start yeah, now it's now you're on. Thanks. Perfect. So um, I'll keep this um, brief and I'll, I'll focus on 
um, the headline. So yeah, really this project was born out of um, previous work where what we wanted to do previously was demonstrate the ability to use CMR to estimate um, LV filling pressure. Um, so that was done as a, as a relatively rudimentary method. Um, ultimately, um, it essentially incorporates um, left ventricular mass and left atrial volume, um, of which both parameters make sense in terms of their relation with um, the changes that you'd expect in the heart in relation to patients who have heart failure. Um, and if you keep an eye on this space, we are hoping to publish further work where we um, produce sex specific models because we've applied it in the UK Biobank and noticed some interesting findings. So um, it's certainly an area which um, we have been building on. And this is where this work came from in terms of being, being able to demonstrate, first of all, the relationship between um, abnormal LV filling pressure estimated using CMR and the very clinic, uh, clinically relevant findings of um, uh, the signs and symptoms associated with heart failure. And also taking that a step further and investigating what is the relationship between these abnormal um, filling pressures um, identified using CMR and very you know, relevant um, outcomes for patients, which is heart failure, hospitalization, um, and mortality. So the primary objective of this work um, was to see whether the CMR-derived LV filling pressure um, was additionally beneficial over established CMR parameters. And the ones that we're all very familiar with are LV ejection fraction and SCAR. Um, so as part of our analysis, you'll see is that we were able to um, adjust for these variables. And, and what you'll see is that even when these uh, ver uh, uh, variables are considered that um, CMR derived LV filling pressure was still prognostically significant. And the real benefit of this is that you're not doing anything additional. You can calculate um, LV filling pressure using CMR, you know, using very simple parameters and there's nothing additional you need to do. Um, so whilst you're getting your ejection fraction and um, assessing function and structure using CMR, you can do this as well. So it's just really another tool in your arsenal. If you think about the way you communicate things with patients, you know, this can become very complex um, for patients to understand, but if you're able to, you know, talk about it in a, in a practical way and talk about risk, and it can certainly change some of the way that you maybe, you know, treat patients in terms of how aggressive you are with medical therapy or how CMR fits in terms of monitoring response to treatment, but certainly it is a, a stark finding that um, the uh, CMR can be used to assess LV feeling pressure and what the assessment with that, uh, what the relation with um, uh, signs and symptoms actually is. So a, a reasonably strong um, um, number of patients, so 510 uh, participants, so all of our participants referred um, who were being investigated for heart failure um, over a, a several year period. And we included those who had at least 12 months follow up. And this is really for the primary outcomes of heart failure, hospitalization and um, mortality as well. Um, so patients had a, a same day CMR in clinical assessment. Um, all, I think pretty much all the patients had um, echocardiography and we did look into the relationship between um, the parameters and CMR and echo. Um, but due to clinical pressures, often that is delayed and it was 90 days here. And what we actually found is, um, because most of these patients were referred as um, heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, and the main purpose of their CMR initially was to try and identify what the etiology of their heart failure was. By the time they had their CMR, lots of their ejection fractions have recovered. And that may be because they were started on medical therapy. So that's something important to consider when um, interpreting the results. And really what we see straight away when you uh, dichotomized based on the LV filling pressure, we used 16.2 uh, because that was the threshold identified in the uh, preliminary work. Certainly there could be some work to see, you know, what thresholds and how they adjust um, and whether there's, you know, sex specific or age specific um, thresholds. But what we you know, very quickly see is that those with um, raised filling pressures are older, they're male, this all makes sense. They've got a higher burden of age fibrillation and um, looking at the medications, they're more likely to be on um, diuretic therapy as well. So you can kind of just see that here in the um, um, figure out consort statement. So 454 went through to analysis as they had more than 12 months of follow-up. So just you know, straight away looking at the um, results in terms of um, hospitalization, certainly 
very evident that those with um, raised filling pressures had a much higher incidence um, of heart failure hospitalization over the follow-up period, which was just shy of three years. So 17% versus 5%. So that's a you know, clinically relevant outcome for patients. Similarly, if they had a raised uh, filling pressure, again, their risk of a decompensated heart failure admission um, was, was higher. So really significant outcomes for, for patients. And if you want to spend some time looking through medications and um, all the parameters, they're all there um, for your viewing. Similarly, as with um, heart failure hospitalization, um, there's an increased risk of um, mortality as well. Um, and this is to the tune of, um, has a ratio of just over three. So, um, and yeah, actually um, figure two is actually a nice um, way of visualizing what those relationships are between raised filling pressures and the symptoms. So if you've got um, a raised filling pressure, you're more likely to be breathless, you're more likely to have orthopnea, and you're also more likely to have the clinical signs of pleuroeffusion, which was basically uh, radiographically identified and uh, often a very debilitating symptom of peripheral edema. So this all makes sense. And it's, you know, it's, it's comforting to know that um, these models make sense and that they are working in a, in a real world population. You know, these weren't selected patients, they were essentially consecutive patients in a real world clinical setting um, undergoing CMR for assessment of their underlying um, you know, cause for their heart failure. So whilst we um, didn't specifically um, include those who've had previous coronary intervention or known ischemic heart disease, because that's a relatively obvious explanation for their heart failure, but in those who then you know, were identified as having ischemia um, and an ischemic etiology when analyzing their CMR, we still include, included those. Um, and I think that's an important point to mention. During um, Kaplan-Meier analysis and subsequent analysis, um, when we were identifying what the independent association was, so um, taking all um, variables into consideration in stepwise modeling, we were able to identify that two metrics were independently associated with heart failure, hospitalization. So that's um, our CMR-derived LV filling pressure, dichotomized at 16.2, and SCAR. And when we did adjusted Kaplan-Meier survival analysis, what we can still see, and you can see that here in, in um, uh, the figures here, is that even when considering SCAR, that um, raised filling pressure is still prognostically significant. And that's important. And again, we have the same finding for MACE as well. So really drawing all of this together, so the main conclusions we took from this is that CMRI-derived filling pressure is helpful and it can predict outcomes in those with a recent heart failure diagnosis. And practically this can help communicate what the future might look like. And certainly there's further questions about what comes next for these patients. Um, it's reassuring that um, CMRI-derived filling pressure is associated with the signs and symptoms. Um, it makes sense. And really it's building on a, a relatively simple model, but it seems like it, it works. Um, there's further work, as I mentioned, to be done around where this may fit in, in terms of monitoring response to treatment. Um, but it's absolutely without question that prevention of heart failure hospitalization is a key, a, a key clinical outcome. And I think it's important that these are the, um, the outcome measures that CMR research um, continues to be focused on. And what we're continuing to see is that um, um, CMR derived LV filling pressure, just because of how simple it is, it's, it's very reproducible, it's very easy to do, and it doesn't require any additional image acquisition. So I think they were the main things I wanted to mention, certainly limitations, single center. Um, I mentioned the point about the recovery of LV ejection fraction. Um, and there's always an element of referral bias because not every patient who's being assessed for um, heart failure is able to tolerate or would be suitable for CMR and certainly those who have impaired renal function or significant respiratory disease, um, you know, wouldn't have been eligible for this and there could be an element of referral bias. But these are all things to consider when interpreting the results of this work. I think that's all I really wanted to say. I'm happy to take any questions or help discuss the implications of this. Thank you very much for this excellent, uh, concise uh, description of the of the paper. 
Um, what I like about this uh, is um, that um, that you use it, in fact, to do something clinically meaningful with it. Uh, of course, uh, prognosis is just, to me, it's just a step in between. Eventually, uh, we will have to, or hopefully uh, others and you can um, actually demonstrate that there is a significant impact on outcome when using that. Yeah. <clears throat> the, I'm not actually too much uh, interest in the accuracy to, to mm. because some people ask for, okay, how good does it correlate and agree with actual LVDP? I, I think that's not the point. The point is, how does it compare to the classical EDP in predicting outcomes and in guiding therapy? Yeah. So can you briefly comment on that? And then also the second question I have is, what are the critical points for those who want to get started with that? The LE volume is, is I mean, maybe you can briefly describe mm -hmm. how you how you analyze that and how you avoid uh, discrepancies or... or yeah, uh, so I, I, I think, you know... Pulmonary yeah. veins or something. Yeah, so the, the main um, value is not the specific um, numerical value you get from the equation. Um, it's all about, is it raised or if it's normal? And if it's raised, you you uh, you know the advice from a clinical point of view is you just need to think very carefully about the patient and you know what is it that is going to be making you feel that they're going to be a higher risk of not having a good outcome. And certainly, if at the time they have their diagnosis, you're looking at them more broadly, they've got a, you know a significantly deranged uh, BNP. They are you know there's evidence of uh, pulmonary edema they've got symptoms their exercise tolerances grow through reduce this is a patient who's, who's not going to do hugely well but then similarly if you have a patient who maybe is at a subclinical stage where their symptoms are quite um minor that it's not having a significant impact on them but they do have raised filling pressures estimated via um you know cmr they're probably the patients who are going to benefit from more aggressive medical therapy actually because even though they're not symptomatic and they've probably not had these, you know, major structural and functional changes in, in their heart, they're the ones who are going to benefit from, you know, all of the great things that we do um, in cardiology to um, benefit patients. Um, from a practical point of view, this is a very simple thing. And actually um, we're working on having this all, you know, automated. We do a lot of automation in terms of LV mass and LAV. I mean, we have no concerns with regards to reproducibility, it's accurate in terms of, you know, I think there's certainly something to, something to look at about progression over time. Um, but for that, you'd need to have recurrent or repeat um, imaging. And I think there's also certain work that can be done to look at the correlation, even at the same, you know, same time echocardiography as well, to see the correlations from with, with that as well. Um, so in summary, I think it's pretty reproducible. Um, the beauty of it is just how simple it is. Um, there may be a role at some point for more individualized um, assessments, but you really do need really large cohorts of patients um, with endpoints to be able to develop models with sophistication. The beauty of this is so simple, LA volume and LV mass, and those are two factors which, from a physiological point of view, just make sense, and, and we know that those um, changes in those parameters are associated with with poor outcome, so it just makes sense. Oh, I think you're on mute. I can't hear you. At least. Oh, sorry, uh, Pankaj, <laughs> you have raised your hand. Just a quick one before we move on to the next paper. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Uh, so thanks, Kyren, uh, for a brilliant presentation. And I just would like to add, I think, on your question, um, the um, the I think in the original paper, we looked at the prognostication versus invasive versus cardiac um, MR. And to be honest, the cardiac MR was non-inferior to the invasive assessment for prognostication, number one point. Number two point, now, Midge, in this study, the other interesting part is all the left atrial assessment has been done using broadly available application circle CVI using the AI automated tool. So you can see there is, you know, not much human interference in, in that assessment it is more broadly um, applicable. Um, yeah. And again, it, it goes down to physiology. You know, you've got a left atrium, which enlarges with increasing preload. Yeah. 
and you've got LV mass, which um, enlarges with increasing afterload. And it's more like a, 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 a HbA1c of afterload problem LV mass. Um, so, you know, yeah. it, it yeah. takes time yeah. to remodel. Yeah. What's interesting is more two recent papers came out, which uh, and one in JCMR is likely to get published, which is not published yet. But um, the the uh, there are studies which are already demonstrating that left atrial volume by CMR actually can acutely map the rise in left atrial volume. So let's say we give adenosine or fluid challenge, the left atrial volume increases, and um, there are studies in pipeline which demonstrate that LA volume increases with exercise within the magnet as well. Mm -hmm. So. It, it, yeah. it's it, it's a high fidelity uh, measurement so it adapts and that's where the adaptation and and actually if you look at the equation it's more dependent on the left atrial volume than the lv mass the relevance of lv mass is um, is is uh, comparatively less it's the la volume so i think that's a few things we've okay. some thank some people uh, yeah so i have to cut you short Bhagat, but i Thank you and congratulations to both of you for, for the really imp interesting and uh, clinically important paper. So uh, I want to ask Ahmed uh, now to from Reza Nezavat's team to uh, share the screen to present his paper published uh, this year in Jack Imaging called uh, Radiomics of LGE Reviews Prognostic Value of Markov Scar Heterogeneity in Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy. Ahmed. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my apologies for uh, the camera, it's not working. But uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. OK, great. OK, thank you. So uh, just uh, uh, as a disclosure, um, uh, this work has been fully uh, uh, done in uh, Beth Israel uh, in uh, Dr. Reza Nezafet's lab. Currently, I'm not uh, affiliated with uh, Beth Israel or the Harvard uh, system. Uh, so um, yeah, in, in this work, uh, we uh, try to investigate uh, the added value of myocardial LGE radiomics to predict sudden cardiac death in uh, HCM patients. So uh, myocardial LGE radiomics, it's basically uh, shape and texture features uh, extracted from the myocardium uh, regions uh, within the LGE uh, images. In particular, we focus on short axis uh, images um, for, uh, of the heart for the HCM patients. So uh, we uh, did, um, we, we developed three models here. Uh, the first one using the radiomics features alone to assess its power of predicting cardiac death uh, risk. And we also used radiomics in combination with uh, clinical models. Basically we used the ASC uh, model and the SC um, HA uh, model. Uh, to develop these models, we uh, used a dead set for 1,229 HCM patients from three medical uh, centers. Uh, we took the images, we uh, uh, segmented the myocardium in these images. We applied principal component analysis to um, uh, reduce the dimensionality because basically radiomics uh, algorithms generate uh, hundreds of uh, features. Um, the uh, just brief uh, observations that we had as results. Uh, the radiomics model alone, so the input is radiomics features, the output was the risk of um, uh, sudden cardiac death as low or high, it's like a binary uh, label. Uh, the radiomics features uh, performance was uh, higher than the ASC model, 0.69 versus 0.57, and also higher than the ACC HA model 0.69 versus 0.67, but not statistically significant. Uh, but we also uh, noted that adding the radiomics risk or the radiomics features to the ESC or the SEC risk predictions improved the uh, power of identifying high risk uh, patients. Uh, in general, the analysis of uh, the radiomics features showed that LG uh, heterogeneity within the myocardium is uh, a significant predictor of sudden cardiac death. It was a major contributor in uh, these models. So uh, 
a quick introduction why we want to improve the accuracy of our models. Well, for uh, HCM patients, sudden cardiac death is um, um, uh, a major complication, threatening 5% of uh, patients. Fortunately, the uh, effective prevention of sudden cardiac death can be achieved using ICD, but we cannot implant ICD in all patients. So we need to put them only in high risk patients. Currently, we have two models, as I mentioned, ESC, the European Society of Cardiology, and the uh, ACC uh, HA uh, models. Um, one major difference between them, the uh, ACC model uses LGE, um, extensive LGE as a, a risk factor. The ACC model does not include um, any information from uh, the LGE. Um, Let's jump to this uh, illustration. So um, this is the basic workflow of our uh, study, uh, 1,229 patients. Uh, Follow-up uh, period uh, was four years. The outcome was uh, any of these events, sudden cardiac death, cardiac arrest uh, was successful uh, resuscitated, uh, and appropriate ICD uh, shock. Uh, we use the clinical records to estimate the risk by the ASC and SC models. We use the LGE images, stack of short axis images. Um, we segmented them, and then we normalized the segmented images within the myocardium alone uh, for um, uniform spatial resolution over all images, all patients, one millimeter by one millimeter, and also uh, dynamic range from zero to one, so the intensity uh, dynamic range. Uh, we use this. Um, we call it scarred tissue maps, which is the uh, LGE images of the myocardium. Uh, we uh, use them to generate or to extract radiomics features. Uh, per slice, we extracted 900, actually 1,800 uh, features uh, because we can't use all of them for uh, the model. We uh, use classical principle component analysis to reduce the dimensionality to use only three principal radiomics. The first three principal components of uh, these uh, features to build our uh, model. So we uh, use them to build the model alone, like radiomics model, and then we combine it with the ESC risk prediction. There's another model and a third model by combining the radiomics um, features with the ACC uh, risk prediction values. Um, this is a process of generating the uh, texture features, the radiomics features. Uh, from each slice, we get 944 uh, radiomic feature. Because we have a stack of short axis slices, uh, we had to decide how to combine all these um, features, uh, given that the number of slices per patient is different. So we uh, decided to uh, integrate them by using the minimum over the slices and the maximum over the slices. So we pick the two extremes, the minimum and the maximum of each feature uh, across the different slices, concatenate them to get uh, almost uh, 1,900 features, and then feed them to uh, the uh, PCA uh, uh, feature selection. Uh, one important thing here is that this uh, process of reducing the dimensionality <clears throat> of the features uh, does not include the labels. It doesn't include uh, any knowledge of the uh, risk of the input uh, uh, slices or the patients. So it's completely blinded to the uh, outcome uh, of uh, our models. Uh, then we restricted our uh, models to use only three <coughs> principal uh, radiomics, uh, which gives us a ratio of uh, 10 outcomes to one predictor in our model to avoid overfitting and try to have um, uh, meaningful uh, statistical uh, analysis. Um, yeah, w one thing important here, the radiomics features, uh, uh, they do not include only the texture or the pattern of the intensity variations within the myocardium. It also includes the sh shape descriptors, like the area of the myocardium in each slice, the uh, elongation, the uh, eccentricity, major axis lengths, and uh, so on. So we have 14 shape descriptors and 930 uh, texture, intensity texture uh, but, uh, features. Um, 
this is a table for the demographics of uh, patients. Uh, there was no significant difference between the high risk and low risk patients, except for the uh, NSVT and the family history of uh, sudden cardiac death. Other than that, there was uh, no significant difference between uh, all these parameters. Um, we can jump directly here. Yeah, so this is the performance of the different models. So the radiomics only model resulted in C statistics or area under curve of 0.69 which was higher than the AC risk prediction, which gave us a under curve of 0.57, and also the AC, ACCHA, which gave us 0.67. Also, including radiomics with the ESC, uh, outperformed the AC alone, and also outperformed the ACCHA uh, model alone. The next thing that we uh, did is to interpret these uh, principal radiomics. So, after applying the principal component analysis to the uh, 180, uh, 1800, uh, sorry, 1800 uh, features, this like kind of transformation um, obscured the, the, the meaning of the features. So we cannot say that heterogeneity from the principal radiomics, we cannot say that uh, this principal component represents the uh, heterogeneity uh, directly. So we had to do some analysis to investigate the meaning of uh, this uh, principal radiomics. So we did two things. First, we uh, studied the correlation between in these principal radiomics and the uh, clinical and risk uh, factors, common risk factors for uh, sudden cardiac death. And we also um, identified the radiomic features, the raw radiomic features, the uh, set of uh, subset from the 1800 uh, features that are highly correlated with these principal uh, radiomics to see what is the uh, most important uh, row uh, radiomic features that can be used for predicting sudden cardiac death. So among the three principal radiomics, the only the second principal radiomic um, had was a, a significant uh, predictor uh, for, for uh, sudden cardiac death using uh, Cox uh, regression analysis, both in the univariate model and the combined models, whether with ESC or the ECC uh, model. This is a correlation <coughs> matrix between the uh, principal radiomics and the clinical um, and risk uh, common risk factors. Uh, we only noticed weak correlation between these radiomics and the clinical uh, risk factors. Uh, basically, the first uh, principal radiomic um, feature correlated with the uh, LV uh, OT gradient uh, greater than 30. Uh, historic anterior motion. Uh, the second and third uh, principal radiomics had like weak to very weak correlation with the LV mass and LV mass index and maximum wall thickness, uh, which probably uh, was included in the shape descriptors that I've just uh, mentioned. Uh, the other we thing when- to, we're Sorry to interrupt, but we have to wrap up quite soon, so- uh, Okay, just okay, I just one- As concise as possible. Yeah, one, one, one observation then I will uh, wrap up. So uh, what we also uh, noticed is um, the co component um, radiomic features of these principal radiomics resulted in, um, we go here, uh, that the uh, only one um, radiomic feature, namely the NGTDM, which is uh, um, a descriptor of the heterogeneity within the myocardium in images. Only this radiomic feature was a significant predictor for sudden cardiac death. Uh, so the higher, the oh, sorry, the lower the heterogeneity, the lower the risk for uh, sudden cardiac death. Uh, the limitations of this study, uh, I'll skip this figure. So the limitation of the study is the um, small number of events. So we have 1,200 patients, but only 30 uh, events. Uh, we also, um, did not explore the uh, use of like more uh, comp complex uh, or sophisticated 
uh, deep learning, machine learning approaches for predicting the risk. However, this could be only done if we have uh, a bigger uh, cohort with a higher number of uh, events. Uh, finally, this is a proof of concept study, and this model is not validated in external cohort, which should be uh, the next step um, based on these uh, results. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, congratulations, and thank you Verb, for the very good presentation here. So I think this is um, this is to me this is consistent with the with the concept of um, that the the fact that the total surface between abnormal and normal tissue and heterogeneity is sort of uh, related to that. Uh, of course, increase the risk for unidirectional blocks in these areas and higher mechanical stress, then giving rise to an increased uh, risk for um, arrhythmia that, of course, increase the risk for malignant arrhythmia and sudden death. So that's, uh, I think, a very, very nice work and, and yeah, that you Kind of uh, eluded the the most important of uh, these features that provides additional value, um, and uh, some may say here yeah, the the air under the curve 0.74 when combined with ACC is still not let's say 0.85. I would uh, argue against that a little bit, saying that um, the 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 pathophysiology of sudden death is so complex and has so many confounders that having a tissue marker that is that good is pretty amazing to me. So congratulations. There is a there is there is a, a question in the but I ask you to copy and paste that on your computer from uh, from Rebecca Thornhill. We will not have the time to discuss that, um, but uh, maybe you can take that offline. Also, a question from Victor Ferrari. Um, sure. So uh, thank you so much. It was great. Um, so if there are no other burning questions, I would like to hand over to Nicole uh, to talk about the next edition of the CMR Journal Club. Yeah, so um, again, thank you for joining us today. So um, the next edition of CMR Journal Club will be in four weeks, I believe it is, on March 6th, again, at the same time. So this is 11 a.m. Um, Eastern time. Um, you know, the times will be sent to you, but it's the same time again. Um, we are still waiting on confirmation from our speakers, but the topic that I have planned is looking at CEST imaging in the heart. So understanding some new technical developments and, you know, potential clinical applications for um, CEST imaging in the heart. So join us then um, in four weeks. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you uh, again, Kiaran and Ahmed for the wonderful presentations. Thanks everybody for joining and uh, for the beautiful science uh, and for what we have learned today. And uh, have a great day until next time. Bye.